Welcome to HealthWise, I'm Joey Pop. This week's medical topic is shoulder pain. It's the second most common musculoskeletal complaint among adults. Now, during the next hour, we will discuss the most common causes of shoulder pain and when you should seek a medical evaluation. You'll also learn what can be done to prevent worsening of the condition and perhaps the newest ways of treating common shoulder disorders. Joining us from Ortho Carolina is Drs. Shadley Schifrin and Natty Hamid. Welcome, gentlemen. We're calling this show Shoulder uh, Solutions here, Shoulder Pain Solutions. And, and with that, we're going to be learning what you call are not only the newest, but perhaps the best ways to address this. Sure. Yes, Joe, we, we felt like uh, we're going to give you uh, our opinion of the best ways that we have to treat these uh, conditions and, and uh, speak to yeah. that, too. Yeah, Joey, shoulder surgery has come a long way in the last 20 years, and there's a lot of new and exciting techniques uh, that uh, we've been uh, experienced with and uh, we'd like to share with the viewers tonight. Well, we absolutely have been overdue having this topic on our show. It's been a while since we've addressed shoulder concerns. It seems that with Ortho Carolina, colleagues of yours have been on, and we've been talking about the knee. But thank you for being here for the shoulder. Thanks absolutely. for having us, Joey. You know, and, and it hasn't been that long ago when we've been talking about having uh, total reverse uh, total shoulder replacement and you're about to talk today also about reverse shoulder replacement so, sure so uh, all these new techniques we're going to be addressing absolutely we've uh, shoulder replacements have been around now uh, since the 1970s in their infancy uh, and we've come miles and miles from from when we first started uh, we've done regular shoulder replacements and and within the last 10 years we also have a newer type of replacement called a reverse shoulder replacement and uh, Natty and I will both uh, speak a little bit about that today. Okay, so you're in for a full hour of education. So as always, we appreciate you being here. Let's first start out with what is shoulder pain? It may sound obvious, but let's go ahead and look at the uh, graphic here and let's address it. Well, uh, shoulder pain is actually the second most common orthopedic problem that uh, a person will bring to their physician. Uh, it affects both young and old people and it can lead to time off work, difficulty sleeping due to shoulder pain, and uh, it can ultimately affect someone's overall quality of life. Now, there's a lot of different causes of shoulder pain, and we'll touch on uh, a lot of these uh, during, the, during the show tonight. The, um, the most common probably is rotator cuff disease, and to, uh, to understand what a rotator cuff tear or rotator cuff disease is, you have to understand what the rotator cuff is. So what the rotator cuff is, it's a group of uh, four small muscles, we have a model here, that surround the shoulder joint. And these muscles start from the shoulder blade and they extend over and, and attach onto the humerus of the ball and socket joint. Now when you say the humerus, let, let, go ahead and give us um, layman terms here. Sure. Well, the shoulder is a ball and socket joint and at the top of this long arm bone, there's the, uh, the ball part of the mm -hmm. ball and socket. So these muscles surround this joint and attach onto the top of the humerus bone. I understand. Is this because of wear and tear with the body? If, if I throw a baseball or play tennis, am I subject to uh, damaging this? Quite possibly, yeah. With age, all tendons in the body can degenerate over time, they can get thin, and they can be susceptible to tearing. And that's exactly what happens with rotator cuff tears. Uh, so this uh, white part on the model you can see is the tendon portion of the rotator cuff, and this is where we see rotator cuff tears. This next slide addresses just how common this is, and when I was researching the show uh, with you guys, it's just, it just really blew my mind here. We're talking about very, very common rotator cuff tears were found in 46% of people, 70 and older, 46%, that's high, isn't it? That's right, and that's actually uh, people that did not have any shoulder pain at all. Wow, they didn't even know it. They didn't even know it, right, right. So we know shoulder, we know rotator cuff tears are extremely common in the general population. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of unanswered questions with rotator cuff disease. As far as the signs and symptoms, if you don't have pain, what do you have? Well, rotator cuff disease can cause weakness. It can cause fatigue in your arm, especially when you're trying to use it for overhead activities. Uh, if you've had a recent injury in your shoulder or you've done a lot of repetitive activities, 
it can, uh, it can certainly aggravate a ongoing shoulder uh, rotator cuff problem. Okay, so it has to be the million dollar question. If I think there's something wrong up here, when is it time to go see a doctor? And that's what this next slide addresses. And let's hear what the experts have to say. Slide number five, here we go. Well, a lot of people will have uh, pain in their shoulder uh, that comes on uh, you know, either after uh, an injury or with overuse. Uh, and sometimes that pain you know, may last a couple of weeks. Uh, we usually recommend that people give it a, a couple of weeks time, mm -hmm. uh, maybe do some rest, use some over-the-counter medication, some anti-inflammatories, uh, and see if the body will heal itself. But if the pain is going on for several weeks uh, or the pain seems to be getting worse, or there are other associated factors, then it's probably the right time to uh, seek medical attention. You know, we're all nervous about going to the doctor. Are you aware of that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we think that if something's wrong, the first thing you guys are going to recommend is, hey, it's time to go under the knife. Sure, sure. Well, I, I actually, uh, you know, we try everything we can uh, to avoid uh, making patients go through surgery. There's there are a lot of non-surgical treatments that we have for shoulder conditions that work well. Uh, so it depends on the nature of the problem, mm -hmm. it depends on what the diagnosis is, but uh, certainly there are, are many, many steps uh, to go through before actually undergoing surgery. Yeah, and I think we're gonna be talking about that more a little later as well. Now, let's go to the next slide. So how do you diagnose having this rotator cuff? Or what kind of tests are involved? Let's see what they have to say. Dr. Hammett? Well, um, if you see a shoulder specialist, uh, frequently you can diagnose a rotator cuff tear just by talking with the patient and examining them. Uh, plain x-rays can also help give you a hint that there may be a rotator cuff tear. And if you suspect one, there's some more uh, definitive imaging studies you can get, including an MRI or a special CT scan. There's also a, a new type of uh, detection tool that uh, is becoming very popular in the United States, and that's the use of ultrasound. Hmm. And we were talking about the treatments. Let's go to the next slide. The phone bank's already filling up, which That's is great. not a surprise That's to us, great. right? So we're going to take some calls here in a few seconds. But uh, how would you treat s such? So let's go ahead and address that in slide number seven. Well, rotator cuff uh, disease uh, is certainly uh, has a, a number of treatments that are non-operative. Uh, and we usually start with things like uh, sending the patients to work with our physical therapist. The physical therapists are very uh, important in the, the treatment, both surgically and non-surgically. Mm -hmm. And they'll work on restoring the range of motion back to the shoulder, uh, work on strengthening all of the rotator cuff muscles and all of the other muscles around the shoulder blade, uh, and trying to get patients back to a good level of function. Uh, sometimes when there is pain in the shoulder, uh, an uh, injection into the shoulder and around the rotator cuff with cortisone, which is a steroid medicine, mm -hmm. can help decrease inflammation and take away pain. If the non-surgical treatments fail, uh, that's when we start getting into uh, discussions with patients about surgical repairs of rotator cuff disease. All right, before we go into the surgical um, repair, we're just, let's take a call out of Salisbury. Carla's with us. Hi, Carla. Hey, how are you? Good, what's your question here for the doctors from Ortho Carolina? Okay, my husband's gonna have to have the rotator cuff tear surgery and also he has a bicep tear. And I was wanting to know, since it's gonna be about two or three weeks before he can have the surgery, what I can do to help him feel better before that? Like, do I treat it with heat or cold or medicine? Right, and he, is he in pain right now? Oh, he's in a lot of pain. It's hard for him to sleep, like laying right. in a bed, stuff like that. This is a great question, Carla, and we thank you for calling in and asking this. Who wants to take it? Dr. Hammond? Sure. Dr. Natty sure. Hammond. Carla, the, uh, that, you know, that's a great question. Um, if he, uh, there's, there's not... Uh, many different uh, things you can try, but there are a few that I would definitely recommend. He should definitely take anti-inflammatory medications, and ice can also help. Um, but he shouldn't try and overuse his shoulder, just he should take it easy until he has it fixed with surgery, because that's going to be the definitive thing to actually help his symptoms. But I would definitely take anti-inflammatories, including, you know, if his stomach can uh, withstand ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, all those are very good at decreasing the inflammation that he, that he probably has surrounding the rotator cuff. So, so just keep him comfortable. Just keep yes. him comfortable until he can get it fixed. All okay. right, Carla. Thank, thank you, you for the much. Thanks for the call. We appreciate that. Let's go ahead and go to slide number eight. Let's, let's keep on the topic ro with rotator cuff. Sure. Seems like there's a lot of interest out there for this. So here we are talking about repair. Dr. Uh, Hammond? Yeah. Um, 
So the rotator cuff, as we've talked about, uh, has a tear in the tendon. So the goal of the surgery is to repair the tendon back down to the bone. We could actually play a video and show the viewers what a rotator cuff tear would look like when we view it arthroscopically. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this, is, this could be graphic, so if, you, if this um, bothers you, you may want to turn your head. But what are we seeing? So what you're seeing is a camera that's inside the shoulder joint, and then we have an instrument coming in from another area and is showing us the tear in the tendon. That's the tear right there. That's the tear. That's the rotator cuff the instrument is on. So the white is all the tendon. That's all tendon. Wow. And that is the whole of the rotator cuff tear. So that's going to be repaired. That is what's going to be repaired, right. right. So, so when you're looking at this, are you looking at a monitor? Do you have like a little camera? Exactly. We have, a, we have the camera inside the shoulder, and we're looking at a monitor inside the operating room and doing everything through small portal incisions. Right. Fascinating. All right, let's go to slide uh, number 10, if we can. And I believe this is also just a slide of what we just saw with the video. Is that true? This should be a video of the uh, rotator cuff repair. So and I'll here it comes now. I'll take you through. What we do is we freshen the bone edge, and we put sutures in the rotator cuff. And we have special anchors that go into the bone so we can allow the rotator cuff to be seated back onto the bone again where it belongs. So these are uh, instruments that we have to place sutures into the rotator cuff tendon. Is this like robot surgery? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that. It's, um, it's actually very fun surgery. So, How long does it take? Um, you know, it can take anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours. And how long did it take you to learn how to do this? I mean, this is such microscopic work here, having to thread the needle and everything. Well, it's kind of like playing a video game, you know. Huh. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually uh, very fun to do, and, uh, but it does take a lot of time and practice. Wow, that's just amazing. That so is this, really something. So that's the sutures, and that's the rotator cuff. And we saw it come yeah. close together right, right at there. the end, right. right. So, so okay, it. so the patient has the procedure. How long does it take for that patient to fully recover? Rotator cuff repairs actually take a, a decent amount of time to get over, and that's one of the things that we try to counsel our patients ahead of time. Uh, typically, we'll have the patient in a sling for about six weeks uh, where they're not doing any use of their arm at all for those six weeks, and that's to allow the tendon to heal. During that time, they'd be doing some physical therapy to, to keep some motion going on in the shoulder, um, but mostly protecting it. Once the sling comes off, then we advance the physical therapy, allow them to start using their arm a little bit more, and then starting to build back strength. But what I tell patients is it's not, a, not unusual to take you know, a good three or four months before they're back doing household daily activities, and probably closer to uh, six to nine months before they're getting back into recreational activities and sports and things. Just have patience with the rehab, have with patience. the recovery. Have patience, because it does take a while. It's not, it's not a quick recovery process. What's the risk of having the procedure? Dr. Hammond? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an important question because whenever you have uh, surgery, uh, the patient should know all the possible risks that they, that they could have, and uh, it's important to have a, a frank discussion uh, with, your, with your surgeon before you undergo any procedures. Um, the risk of having any surgery, there's always a risk, a small risk of bleeding, infection, anesthetic complications, but more specifically with rotator cuff repair, there's risks to having stiffness of the shoulder after surgery. Why is that? Because of the scar tissue? Exactly. Whenever you have surgery, scar tissue is inevitable. It will form. And we have physical therapies, uh, physical therapists we work with that will help uh, move the shoulder after surgery to prevent the scar tissue from being a problem. Now, wait a second. When you say move the, the shoulder, uh, are you not supposed to keep it perfectly still while it's repairing after the procedure, or do you want a patient to move? We, we want controlled motion, and uh, there are some movements that are very helpful and avoid, and avoid the, the stiffness mm -hmm. complication, mm -hmm. uh, but that has to be done very carefully because there's a uh, uh, there's uh, a, a window where you can have good motion, and then if but if you have an excessive amount of motion, you could compromise the rotator cuff repair. Yeah. So, so what is the, the right window? Balance. What's the window here? As soon as I go home, uh, I've had my procedure. I'm I'm like this for a bit in a sling, or am I with a physical therapist doing some movement shortly after the procedure? 
Well, I typically have my patients come back and see me about 10 days after the surgery. Mm -hmm. And for those 10 days, they're in a sling, and they're not using their shoulder for much activities at all. Because they're sore, right? They're sore. I want the swelling to go down. I want them to be comfortable. Uh, and then after I see them in the office, then we'll institute physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And that'll just be some gentle range of motion exercises until we feel confident that the rotator cuff repair is healed. And that usually can be somewhere in the order of, of, of six to eight weeks. And then we'll advance the amount of motion that we have the patients do with the therapist. Okay. The younger you are, is it a quicker recovery time as opposed to an older person, or does it matter? You know, they're probably the recovery time's about the same. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. And then a patient can go all the way up here like this, whereas before they could only do this. That's what the is the satisfaction, not only from the patient, but you, the surgeon? The rotator cuff repair surgery has been very successful uh, traditionally. Um, it went from open repairs, uh, which were the gold standard, and now I think the majority of us who do a lot of shoulder surgery are, are now doing these arthroscopically pretty exclusively. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very good satisfaction rate. Um, there have been a lot of studies looking at the outcomes of these types of repairs and, and well over 90% uh, satisfaction rate from both the patients as well as, uh, as us with, you know, mm -hmm. with the factors that we look at as far as success. Is that why you're in this business? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And, and Dr. Natty Hammond, let's go ahead and make it perfectly clear and let our viewers know that you're, you are new to Charlotte. You've actually yes. come back correct? That's right. Why That's did you right. come back? You left us. <laughs> I know. Well, I, I couldn't stay away. Yeah. Um, I did my uh, residency training in Charlotte, and mm -hmm. then I uh, went to St. Louis at Washington University, where I did a shoulder and elbow fellowship. Right. And so I've just recently returned to Charlotte to uh, uh, come back and, uh, you know, um, um, raise your family and have right. a good lifestyle, right? That's right. And we're very happy to be back. Okay. Uh, Dr. Schiffer, let's hear a little bit about your background. How long sure. have you been here and, and why are you here? I've been uh, in the Charlotte area now for uh, almost five years and uh, the last two years with Ortho Carolina here in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I grew up out west actually and did all, most of my training out in the, the west. I uh, did a, my uh, shoulder fellowship after residency in Dallas, Texas. And, uh, and my wife's family is from here around the Charlotte area. So uh, we we uh, found Charlotte. Uh, we've been out here now five years, and we love it. It's and your wife's also a doctor. She is. Uh, she's a uh, one of the trauma surgeons at Carolina's Medical Center. Wow. So keeps us busy. Oh, I'm sure it does. <laughs> I'm sure it does. All right, let's go back to uh, the slides if we can, and let's go in and, and address shoulder arthritis. Uh, slide number 11. Boy, this is something that uh, we hear of quite a bit, isn't it? So shoulder arthritis is another one of the most common causes of shoulder pain that we see patients come to see us in the office for. And especially in patients who are over the age of 50, we start to see more shoulder arthritis. And arthritis really is a pain which is due to the deterioration of the cartilage surface of the, uh, surfaces of the shoulder joint. Shoulder arthritis is typically more a slowly progressive disease with, with no real known cure. And it can lead to pain, weakness, popping and catching, and stiffness in the shoulder. Next slide. What are these, x-rays? These are uh, two x-rays. Uh, the x-ray on the left uh, showing what a normal shoulder looks like. And just like uh, uh, Dr. Hammond was explaining to us, the ball and socket joint, you can see a normal, nice, smooth ball on that left side. Yes. And the socket is right next to it. That's a, a little flat dish. There's a nice dark space between those two bones. And contrast that with the x-ray on the right side, which is an x-ray with severe shoulder arthritis. And what you can see is complete collapse of that space between the ball and the socket to the point where there's bone rubbing against bone in there. And so oh. that's what we call that bone-on-bone -bone contact. There are also large bone spurs. If you look at the very bottom of the ball, there's a large bone spur down there. And those spurs uh, start to, to impinge together, and that can also be a, another reason why patients lose motion as well as get pain with this. Uh, and this disease. is totally separate from a, from a rotator cuff injury, correct? This is a, it's separate, but there are uh, a lot of cases where there is uh, both arthritis and rotator cuff disease, uh, and that's where the reverse replacement has come in. Oh, which we're going to learn a little bit uh, later on. All right, so let's talk about treatments for shoulder arthritis. The next couple of slides help us with that. Dr. Hammond? So shoulder arthritis can be treated in a couple different ways. We like to separate treatment options into two general terms being operative and non-operative. So we, we typically start with non-operative treatment measures, and that would include the use of anti-inflammatory medications, um, corticosteroid injections uh, directed uh, directly into the shoulder joint can also be very helpful to reduce the inflammation. 
and sometimes physical therapy can be helpful. No, and when you say these, uh, these injections, how long do they last as far as helping with the pain, if at all? Yeah, Joey, that's completely variable. Mm -hmm. It can help some patients um, a, a few months, and others it'll help only for a few days. And there's not really any way to tell how much an injection will help a patient. Right, and then is it fair to say some patients don't get relief at all? That's, yes, sure. definitely true. And, and when you have a patient like that, is it then time to go to the next step? Well, you know, I like to t talk to my patient to see how much the shoulder problem is affecting their life. Is Quality it, of life we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. Is it, is it disturbing their sleep? Mm -hmm. Are they able to do the things they want to do? Are they able to work? You know, these are things that are very important to people, and, if, and these are things that uh, if, if, you're ha if, these are, if your shoulder is affecting these things, it may be time to consider other options. Hmm. Okay, great. Let's go to the next slide, and here we're talking about total shoulder replacement. Now, why would someone have the total shoulder replacement? Because of the arthritis? Because of the arthritis and because of the pain that the arthritis causes. Uh, so shoulder replacement was really developed to, to treat these conditions uh, like the X-ray on the left where there's just no cartilage left and it's bone completely rubbing against bone. And so what we do in shoulder replacement is actually to take off the very top of the ball uh, from the ball and socket joint and replace that with a metal ball and replace the socket cartilage with a plastic socket. And we actually have a, a little uh, demonstration. Yes, bring that up here and let's take a look. Sample of what this looks like. Is that titanium? The, the stem that goes down inside the humerus bone is usually titanium. Uh, and most of these heads are made out of a cobalt chrome material. Okay, explain to us why the materials are what they are. The, uh, the, the, titan the reason the titanium uh, is that it's closer to the modulus of bone, so it, it oh. fits well down in the bone. The body likes it well. And the body accepts that. The body accepts it well. The cobalt chrome uh, is able to give a nice smooth finish, and it, it uh, fits well within the, the plastic uh, socket. So, so that is actually down into the bone. So this, is, this goes down into the bone, into the arm bone. Right. Uh, and then on the socket side, we, we flatten off the patient's own socket, and we have devices that prepare the bone, and then this plastic socket piece, give me a good picture of it, right. is actually cemented into the bone. And so when the shoulder, when they're coupled together, they end up looking like this, with the ball being able to, to glide smoothly on that socket. And so it, it gives the patient back a nice smooth range of motion. It takes away the pain from the arthritis, and it allows them to get back to a, a good functioning shoulder. Is it fair to say that the arthritis is gone? It is. Once we, put the, once we take out the, the surfaces of, of the joint, the arthritis is by definition gone. We've gotten rid of that joint. What's the chance for the other shoulder to go bad if one has? Dr. Hammond, you want to address that? Yeah, with both rotator cuff uh, disease and with shoulder arthritis, it's very common for someone to have the same disease process going on on the other shoulder. Mm -hmm. And uh, it may not ever be a problem for the patient. They may live the rest of their life without ever having to uh, seek medical attention for that. But when we have investigated that closely, usually there's signs that there is the same disease going on on the other side, albeit maybe not quite as bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. And are there, uh, are there times when you would actually do both shoulders at the same time, or is it a separate procedure? Uh, it's, it, it's a little different than, I you know in some cases that but patients will elect to do knee procedure things at the same time, both sides. Oh, is that right? With, with the upper extremity, it's much more difficult. And you think of all the daily activities of you know, hygiene and things you have to, to, you know, to handle. If both arms were in a sling, it's almost impossible for people to, to function. And so we right. typically uh, pick uh, which shoulder bothers them the worst, take care of that one first, let it recover enough that then it can be functional and can take care of uh, daily activities before moving on to the other side. So with the rotator cuff procedure and the recovery, is it, is it similar to the total shoulder replacement or is it more even more so? No, actually it's pretty similar to, to the recovery from a rotator cuff. Um, and I know uh, different colleagues of mine, uh, we, we manage patients post-operatively different as far as how long do we keep them in a sling, how long are they in physical therapy? Uh, but again, most patients within a good three to four months are back functioning, doing daily activities, using their arm. Uh, for anybody who does recreational activities, uh, playing golf or tennis, um, or you know, just things that are a little more physical, is probably more like six months minimum for that time. You know, six months really does sound like a short period of time. 
Um, are there patients who require even more so? Absolutely. Uh, it, it is not uncommon for, for recovery from one of these procedures to ultimately take as long as a year. Um, and, and I tell my patients that before surgery that um, expect that you're still going to probably be recovering a year into it. Right. And in some cases, probably even longer. Patience. Patience. Patience is the key is what I'm hearing from the docs. All right, we're going back to Salisbury. We're popular in Rowan County. Excellent. We have Beatrice this time. Hi, Beatrice. Yes. Hi, what's your question for Dr. Hammond and Dr. Schifrin? Okay, I had my Rory cuff replaced probably about, uh, six, about, maybe about six years ago. Okay. And for the last six months, it had been, I can't hardly raise my arm. It had been like, like it's in a knot or something like that. It's constant pain. I can't hardly sleep. They did, they supposedly did it on my right one, but when they x-rayed me, my left one was worse, so they just did one of them. And I want to know, do I need that total show replacement or what? Or do they need to go back in it and do something to it? All right, let's hear what the docs have to say, okay? Beatrice, thank you for that question. Well, Beatrice, it, it, it's a very good question, actually. And, uh, and we do see patients, that, like in your case, that have had problems with one side and then problems with another side as well. Um, it all depends on what the quality of that rotator cuff tendon and muscle are as far as what is the best option for your shoulder. And so I think certainly in your case, with as long as this has been going on, it would benefit you to uh, see somebody for that. And also we would then probably do some of the more advanced imaging, like get an MRI of your shoulder to look really what is the quality of that rotator cuff. And is the rotator cuff intact? If the rotator cuff uh, is indeed torn, um, there are some changes that we look for that, that, that suggest the chronicity uh, or you know, the, the tendon actually gets atrophied, uh, and it can get to a point where it's not repairable, and in those cases, we start talking more about replacement. Uh, so I think we would have to evaluate your rotator cuff more with some imaging studies to give you an answer. All right, Beatrice, thank you so much. We wish you the best of luck, okay? Let's come, let's come back to the Queen City. We have Paul with us now. Hi, Paul. Paul, you're on the air. Excuse me. Hi, you're on the air. Go ahead. Oh, What's your question? Thanks. Yeah, I used to hear about torn cartilage. Now I hear about rotator cuff tears. Is that the same thing? Good question. Is it the same thing? Is it different? Like, let's let's hear what the difference is, if it if there is. Um, Paul, the uh, the difference between torn cartilage and the rotator cuff is uh, it has to do with where that injury is in the shoulder joint. The rotator cuff is the tendon that attaches the muscle to the bone part of the shoulder joint, and that allows the shoulder to function. Uh, torn cartilage in the shoulder is, uh, there's a small uh, cartilage rim around the socket, and that, so and that cartilage rim allows the shoulder to be stable through full range of motion. So it's two different structural things in your shoulder. Both are very important, uh, but uh, they are treated differently. Paul, does that answer it? Okay, so I need to have a doctor examine it to figure out which one it is. That's right. That's right. You okay, can frequently thanks. tell which one it is based on a, a good physical examination, and then sometimes uh, uh, some advanced imaging studies are, are also very helpful. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, we thank you for that. Getting back to what Beatrice was asking, how often is it or is it rare for someone to have had rotator cuff repair or therapy and then be told perhaps maybe you need a total shoulder replacement? Um, that's not too common, Joey. The uh, rotator cuff repairs, uh, like Dr. Schifrin said, is actually a fairly um, a consistent procedure mm -hmm. that ha does give predictable results, but it is, it is sometimes common, especially with large rotator cuff tears. Uh, the larger ones are prone to fail, and fail mean uh, once it's repaired, it re-tears again. Mm. And once it retears, what's the percentage of that? Do we know? Well, the larger tears, if those are fixed, those can actually have a high retear rate, sometimes even 40, 50 percent. And then, how do I know if it's a large tear as opposed to a small tear? Does the surgeon or the doctor tell me that prior to or that's following? Right. No, that's right. We would figure that out based on a physical exam of the patient. We can tell how large the tear is based on the functional deficits a patient has, and also with advanced imaging studies like an MRI.
Wow. Okay. Well, half the show's gone. Wow. It goes fast, doesn't it? It does. And we do have other callers that are waiting to talk with us. Hey, by the way, you can also email me. You see the, the telephone uh, number on the screen there, but you can also email me, jpop at wtbi.org. Hey, I'm also accepting tweets. Go to <laughs> Joey C. Pop if you're a Twitter account holder, okay? We're going to take our break. You're enjoying HealthWise right here on WTVI. An educational grant for HealthWise is provided by Ortho Carolina, a comprehensive orthopedic practice with locations throughout the Charlotte region. And viewers like you, thank you. If you would like support group information about tonight's topic or any other HealthWise topic, call SupportWorks at 704-331-9500. Natty Hammett of Ortho Carolina. Join us by calling or emailing questions for the next few minutes because the next 25 minutes will fly by, and we thank you so much for being here. Okay, callers are waiting, but we want to address the next issue here, reverse shoulder replacement. Let's go ahead and go to that slide if we can. Now, what is this compared to the total shoulder replacement? What, what do you mean by reverse? Well, the reverse shoulder replacement uh, was actually uh, designed uh, by our colleagues over in France. Uh, and they started to, to look for a, pro for a solution to a very difficult problem. And the problem was patients we were seeing that had arthritis, where they had lost all that cartilage and worn down the joint, but they also had a problem with the rotator cuff. So chronic rotator cuff tears and the arthritis. And as you can see on that x-ray on the left, the ball actually d uh, subluxates out of the socket and, uh, and rises in a superior direction. And previously, if we just did a regular shoulder replacement for this problem, we'd see the same problem. The Supplicates, what does that mean, by the way? The ball would, uh, would dislocate um, mm. and would not be stable. So the, ah. the metal ball that we put in would be moving all over because it didn't have the rotator cuff to hold right. it in place. Uh, so the design basically is, is called a reverse shoulder replacement. Oh. And, uh, and I got a little model because it's sometimes uh, hard, to, hard for people to, to, uh, to grasp the concept. So in this reverse shoulder replacement, we actually place the metal ball up where the old socket used to be. So that's the, the metal ball, and there are screws that hold that into the bone, and that's, so this is the, so the end of the socket by the shoulder blade. And then down in the arm bone, it still has the little metal stem that goes down inside right. the bone. But rather than have the ball on it, it now has the socket piece attached at the arm bone. So it reverses the orientation of the shoulder joint and has the ball up above and the socket down below. And Which this is, is the way it functions. Right. Just to make sure our viewers, in case we have different viewers here from the first half of the hour. So from this to this, yes. correct? And this, this we call a, a semi-constrained uh, design because this is inherently more stable. The, the, ball, the ball really sits down in that socket well, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to, to this one, which is unconstrained, and it really relies on that rotator cuff to keep it stable. I see. So, okay. the fun so this reverse shoulder replacement, we can, it'll actually function without a rotator cuff, mm -hmm. and the patients still have a good deltoid muscle, and it allows the arm to, to uh, work, and it's really been revolutionary in the, in the treatment of uh, these conditions. How long have these procedures been around, total shoulder and reverse? The total shoulders were first designed in the 70s uh, and have been kind of around for you know, about the last 25, 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, these reverses really have only been uh, in the United States uh, for about nine and a half, ten years now. Mm. Uh, our colleagues in France, in France, uh, where they were designed, have been doing them for around 18, 20 years now. That's believe, right. Is the, yep. the long-term follow-up. And by the so. time FDA approved here, it was, it was yeah. 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 So we're a little behind as far as some of our follow-up, but uh, you know, as Dr. Hammond just got back from, from a meeting in France and was able to, uh, to meet with some of the French surgeons who have even longer track record than we do. Wow. Did yeah. you work with some of these surgeons that uh, worked on reverse? I did, yes, yes, and uh, it's very nice to go over there because, uh, like Chad said, they've been doing these replacements for a longer period of time, mm -hmm. and whenever you do a replacement, the, the big question for us is how long will it last? Yeah. And since we've been doing these since around 2004, our follow-up is about seven, eight years uh, for uh, patients in our area. So we want to know how long will these implants last, and that way, if we look at places like France that have been doing them longer, we can have a better idea and we'll be able to tell our patients 
what was the, going to be the survival of the shoulder prosthesis at long term? Uh, how about that? Let's go over to Locust. We have Faye with us now. Hi, Faye. Um, about 10 years ago, I began having uh, pain under my shoulder blade, blade, just sort of at the edge. And as in more recent times, it spread to about all over my shoulder. Now it's beginning to go under my arm. Mm. Uh, any comments for me? You said arthritis? Well, I don't know. Okay, um, but you're having the pain, correct? Right. Okay, let's hear what they have to say. Thank you. So, Faye, uh, sometimes pain uh, around the shoulder blade can be coming from uh, from different areas. And so anytime we see patients that have pain around that shoulder blade, it's really important for us to get a good physical examination. Uh, there are, are other conditions besides arthritis in the shoulder or besides rotator cuff disease that can cause that pain around the shoulder blade and sometimes the pain that goes down the arm. And there is a lot of crossover between uh, neck-related issues um, people can get, you know, some arthritis in the neck or some pressure on the nerves, and then those can come down around the shoulder blade and down around the arm. And so I think especially in a, in a condition like pain around the shoulder blade, it's very important uh, that we examine your shoulder uh, to start the process. Thank you. Okay, Faye. Hey, I'm taking a tweet. Let's go ahead. This is a first for HealthWise. We're just starting this, guys. <laughs> I'm getting a tweet from, uh, I think, um, let's see, Mason. Uh, my husband had replacement and now shoulder f has frozen what to do hmm. who wants to take it yeah that's uh has had a replacement and now the shoulder is frozen yeah yeah that's uh that's a very tough problem actually Joey the uh, like we talked about earlier uh, getting the shoulder moving after a shoulder replacement is essential and if you end up getting stiffness you have to intervene early so we like to really be aggressive with therapy uh, sometimes even an uh, injection in the shoulder can help reduce the inflammation to get the shoulder moving. But mm. it's something we take seriously, and we want to get the shoulder moving as, as quickly as we can. So. And, and could that be because of the scar tissue? And is there, a, is there therapy that the cracking can actually be loosened? Yeah, the, uh, it's, it's mostly... Uh, it's almost always scar tissue that forms. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's important to do physical therapy after you, you've developed a little bit of stiffness. And so some you, of that can be unpleasant sounding, can it not? Yeah, and that, so that's why we want someone to be able to go slowly so we uh, avoid the uh, uh, torturing right. sessions of therapy. So it has to be done with a professional that knows how to do it, and so the patient won't be in that much discomfort as right. they improve their motion. And if it is done properly, it can be rewarding. Absolutely. Because it does bring out the, the movement that needs to be done, correct? Yes. That's yes. all part Absolutely. of the of the recovery, the therapy as I understand it. All right, now another big part of this show, we wanted to address anthroplasty, and Dr. Uh, Schifrin's gonna help us with that. So let's go to slide number 18, and it was a doctor who helped with this innovation, correct? A Dr. Near? Yes, uh, when we talk about shoulder replacement surgery, uh, we're, we're really talking about shoulder arthroplasty, and, and so, so arthroplasty really means um, replacement of the joint. Uh, and Dr. Neer was uh, a very famous shoulder surgeon up at uh, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. And he's really thought of as the modern, modern uh, the father of modern shoulder surgery. And uh, he was the first one to really design these types of shoulder replacements that we use uh, to this day and age. And, he, and it's remarkable how much of his designs are still uh, you know, being used in, the, in 2011. So we owe a lot to Dr. Neer. Doc, uh, slide number 20, let's go to that one next, Jerry. And of course, we've been looking at these models here on set, but this slide kind of sums it up beautifully in the body, right? Absolutely, so this is a very very nice slide with, with both of the designs side by side. Uh, and the, the uh, picture on the right shows a regular shoulder replacement with the ball attached to the top of the arm bone and that plastic socket sitting over at the edge of the shoulder blade. Whereas the x-ray on, or the picture on the left uh, really shows the reverse. And the reverse replacement has the ball anchored into that uh, shoulder blade and then the socket piece sitting below and attached down to the arm bone. So a good way to illustrate it. Slide number 22, the different designs. Um, this gives you an idea of the close-ups, especially with the screws. That actually goes right in, right? Absolutely. So uh, obviously there have been a lot of advances uh, since Dr. Neer's uh, initial early designs. And a lot of these are now what we call modular. 
meaning that we, uh, our goal is to try and make that shoulder as close to the patient's normal anatomy as we can. So there are different sizes of the ball, uh, there are different offsets of the ball, uh, there are different designs of the socket. Uh, so the socket can either be done with what we call a keel or, uh, or has three pegs uh, for fixation into the bone. Uh, so there's a lot of different options that we as the surgeons have available to us, and it's nice for us to have a, you know, a, a multitude of options when we get into surgery so we can try and match that uh, to each patient individually. So I want to go to slide number 27 next, and this shows the gentleman holding his arm straight up. Prior to a procedure, how far could he go? And it'll be coming up here in just a second. And, and uh, this slide also has the different uh, devices Apparently, this is what he had put in, um, and you're going to be seeing it. There we go. Well, that's, that's fine. That's your third generation. So that's this, actually slide number 23, but we'll take that one next. So this slide, again, is just, just shows you know, what, what the latest generation of these prostheses have, and it, it gives us more freedom to really match the patient's anatomy, different options that we have available to us. Okay, until we get that slide up 27, let's go to Mary and Matthews. Hi, Mary. Hello. Hi, Mary. How are you? Well, I'm all right, I guess. What's your question for this team? This is a, uh, a, just a minor thing compared to what you all have been talking about. But I, uh, I think I injured my shoulder uh, with repetitive motion using a wheelchair mm. to... Um, you may want to turn down your TV, Mary. It's kind of um, making you... Stop and listen to yourself talk there. Okay. Uh, anyway. Just the repetitiveness, right? And that maybe goes back to the rotator cuff where you've been using the same motion every day. So are you feeling well, some pain? I don't pain? use it now. I mean, I don't uh, have to do that. But oh. every now and then uh, when I'm reaching for something or putting my hand up or doing something, I will get a twinge on this shoulder. Oh. And I'm wondering what I can do to uh, make the pain be less. Could I use a, a hot water bottle on it or ice? Or is there something else I could do? That's a great question. Yeah. And we all can relate with what you're talking about. So in an acute, hopefully it's acute, in a, in a situation like that, ice or heat? Yeah. You want that one? I like <laughs> I vote ice. I like ice a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, ice just makes sense to me. Um, ultimately, I tell a patient to do whatever makes the shoulder feel better. But uh, ice reduces inflammation. And most people have pain because the shoulder is inflamed. Um, there's so many people that have come see me, and when they have she's describing something that sounds to me like a rotator cuff issue. Yeah. But they almost always have some type of... Uh, uh, event that they can recall like she did. I was painting for eight hours or I reached up something to get something heavy out of a cabinet. Right. So that's a typical uh, uh, history that a patient will give me when they have rotator cuff problems. So likely it's a rotator cuff tendonitis or maybe in a rotator cuff tear that has inflammation around it. So I would recommend to her that uh, use anti-inflammatory medications and put ice on it and give it some time to get better on its own. Okay, how long do you keep the ice on it? Because I know personally I'm sitting there <laughs> thinking, okay, I can't take it anymore. Yeah. Uh, I usually tell my patients 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off. Really? Yeah. Okay. And how's the best way to do that? If I don't have an ice pack, how's the best way? Just get a plastic baggie and fill it up with ice cubes? What? Yeah, a Ziploc bag, fill it up with ice. And um, you may want to put a, a, a thin... Um, um, material like a, a cloth, a yeah, towel, like a wash cloth something, something over your skin and then put the ice directly on it. Okay. I'll tell another, another uh, good easy thing is a, uh, a bag of frozen peas. Get a bag of Excellent. frozen peas and yes. it fits right over the top of the shoulder. So and you still you can have, eat those have peas right around later, your house. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> great, great suggestion. And Mary, thank you. We really appreciate, you know, sometimes we start into these topics at the top of the show and there's no such thing as a small question or something that's minor because we all can relate with what you're talking about. And as a follow-up to that, Mary, let's say that she has this pain and it won't go away. When's it time to come see an expert like yourselves for further evaluation? Well, I, uh, 
I would tell her if you're having pain that keeps you up at night, if you're having uh, weakness in your shoulder that prevents you from being able to lift it, especially above your head, those are two things that you may want to have that evaluated. Okay. All right. 27 shows the guy with his hand over his head, so let's go ahead and go to it next. Before he was able to do that... I, I think this is a very interesting slide that, okay. that kind of speaks to uh, the importance of this reverse shoulder replacement. Uh, this gentleman had that problem that we talked about with bad arthritis in his shoulder and no rotator cuff. And so he had his right shoulder done first in the era before the reverse replacement was available. And you can see his x-ray on the right, and they did a nice job. He's got a nice metal ball in there. The, the, uh, everything's lined up nicely. But because he does not have a functioning rotator cuff, he's not able to still raise his arm above his head. Mm. Um, he had the same problem on the left side, and so when it came time to have the left side done is when he had uh, the reverse replacement put in. And you can see, obviously, the different, the dramatic difference in the functional result that he got from the reverse uh, as opposed to the uh, primary replacement. How will I know which, which kind I need? The surgeon will determine that? Absolutely. That's something that, that your surgeon will have to evaluate and uh, based on your physical examination, uh, based on your imaging studies, uh, your x-rays, your MRI scans, we'll know that ahead of time going into the operation. Okay, so let's make sure, let's get a little summary of what we've been talking about here. The umbrella, ladies and gentlemen, as I understand it, is the arthroplasty as far as restoration and making sure that these devices are inserted properly and they help with the solution. And we're talking about under that umbrella, rotator cuff repair and also total shoulder replacement as well as reversal. Is that fair? Sure. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I think two things that have really revolutionized shoulder surgery in the last 10 years have been arthroscopic shoulder surgery to be able to fix a rotator cuff through one centimeter incisions right. around the shoulder. Which is minimally invasive. Minimally invasive. And, uh, has uh, certainly uh, sped up the recovery. After and we're talking surgery. about outpatient in these cases? Outpatient surgery, right. Wow. Yeah. As yeah. opposed to what, a few years back? A patient was in the hospital for several days or what? Oh, uh, before arthroscopic rotator cuff repair, uh, open rotator cuff repair was performed. And with that, it would be a large incision and it would be, you would have to detach the deltoid muscle, which mm. is uh, the large muscle overlying the rotator cuff to get to it. Uh, and that led to longer recovery and um, um, definitely more, more, more pain after surgery uh, than with the techniques we can use now. Also more blood loss? A little more blood loss, yes. Yeah, because yeah. in those, the video clips that we saw, we never yeah. saw any blood. Right. Why is that? Well, when you can uh, use arthroscopic uh, instruments, uh, you can do so without making large incisions. And so you can just use... Uh, uh, water inside the joint to be able to see everything you need. So there's very little blood loss, if any, during those surgeries. Okay. For our newer viewers that are checking in with us, we've been talking about the latest advances. And this next slide uh, is number 28. We've been talking a little bit about these, but let's go ahead and uh, spend some more time on it here uh, with the slides. What are we looking at? So these, uh, th this slide shows some of the, the particular latest advances that we've had in, in shoulder replacement. And uh, that is uh, some designs on the actual metal itself uh, to allow these prostheses to be put into the bone without cement. And so uh, we like to be able to, you know, just, you know, we have instruments that, that basically machine the inside of the bone and then put the, the metal prosthesis right down in the bone and for that to fit solidly mm -hmm. and for the bone to grow into that metal. So these, uh, these metal uh, finishes are very are porous. They almost, uh, they try to recreate what the structure of the bone looks like, and they allow the bone from the patient to grow into that prosthesis for stability. And it allows us to do these operations without having to use cement in certain cases. And then the next slide, the, stort, the short stems. Um, and this is, a, this is just another, uh, another advance that we've had, is, is being able to, to, to take, you know, less, affect less of the patient's bone uh, when we're using these prostheses. And so uh, that when we use a shorter stem, it obviously means you have, you have less metal that has to go down inside the patient's bone. Compared to this on Compared set? Compared to this one. Huh. So, um, so those short stems uh, we, uh, preserve some more of the patient's uh, bone uh, and obviously are, are going a little bit easier for us. And how recent are these advances? 
Uh, those advances are, are things that have been coming over the, just the last uh, two or three years. Is that right? Yeah. And Some of the, the early follow-up on, especially the, the one that the really is, is, I think is still being studied is using the, the socket piece, that plastic piece, without cement. Uh, that's still one that not everybody is doing, uh, and we're, we're still trying to find out. Is it going to be the right answer for everyone? Okay, so what kind of feedback are we getting? You know, a few years back we heard that uh, there were some complications with hip replacements. Uh, are we getting any complaints with the shoulder? Uh, you know, thank goodness, knock on wood, we, we've not had any issues like those mm -hmm. recalls uh, mm -hmm. with the shoulder. Um, or with the hip. As, or, as the hip. Um, but uh, you know, that's why there there's certainly is a lot of research still going into right. all of these procedures to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Are there any trials going on with even uh, future advances that we know of? Yeah, the... Uh the implants that we use uh, to do shoulder replacements have uh, uh, very good research and development teams and are, are trying new and different things to improve the, uh, improve the surgery, improve the techniques, mm -hmm. and improve the longevity of the implants we use all the time. Like, did you see any of this in France when you were over there? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they're able to get FDA approval on things a lot quicker than the United States is, so, which is good for us because we can get a good idea of uh, what are the good things that are going on there before we incorporate it into our healthcare system? Okay, let's go over to Stanley. George is with us. George, it wouldn't be a HealthWise without a viewer from Gaston County calling in. How are you? All right. Good. What's your question? Um, I have one arm, left arm, and my left shoulder has a rotator cuff. Um, what do you recommend? Uh, replacement or uh, uh, stay like it is? Or Because I depend on work on it. Did you understand the question? So did you say you've had the rotator cuff procedure? No. No, you have not. You're having the problems. Right. Okay, so the question is, what would be done for you? What's the best thing to do? Okay, what's the best thing to do so, for a rotator cuff? Yeah. So, George, have you had this evaluated already? Yes. He, uh, the doctor wouldn't do it because he said uh, I put a lot of torch in it and, uh, and uh, because I depend on work on it. So, uh, and he said you're still young. I mean, 60 years old. I don't know. Okay. And are you having a lot of pain with your shoulder now? Uh, not too much, but sometimes, yes. Okay. Well, I, I think uh, it, it depends a little bit on, you know, what the quality of your rotator cuff looks like. Uh, but certainly, you know, if you have a tear in your rotator cuff and it is causing you pain and giving you problems, uh, it's something that we would probably recommend fixing. Yeah. Uh, and repairing. And George, listen, we say this just about every week on HealthWise. Get a second opinion if you're not satisfied with what you've been told. If you think, gee, you know, they're talking about my age here, get staying out of work. Uh, we're talking about quality of life, correct? That's what we're right. talking about. And, and what is, what, is there a, uh, a, a, an age limit that we should consider with these procedures? That's a good question. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I think that um, patients are different uh, depending on uh, how healthy they are, uh, what type of activities they like to do. So uh, an 80-year-old person uh, may be healthier than most 40-year-old people. Mm -hmm. So we try not to discriminate based on just age alone. Right. It, are, could you be too young? I know that I have a friend who was told, let's hold off a little bit on hip replacement. And because of the concern, are, if these devices are going to last the rest of his life, is there a concern for that with the shoulder? Absolutely. I, I think that is one thing that, that we certainly try to, to focus on in patients who have, especially the thing we see is, is shoulder arthritis at a young age mm. uh, because of that longevity problem. Right. And you know, even if some of the, the, the best studies show that these prostheses are, may last you know, 15 to 20 years, if you're 40, that only puts you to 60, and then you're faced with, you know, if things do wear out, having to go back in a second time. Each time you have something like this done, it, it's more complicated. It's not always a right. straightforward, oh, we'll just do it again. Which so. is even more of a reason why, hey, look, when you go in to be evaluated, you're going to look at options non-operative before Absolutely. you actually do have a procedure, correct? Absolutely. It's been a great hour. We're <laughs> the time's gone, guys. Wow. You're going to have to come back. You've been new guests to HealthWise, and you've been wonderful. So we thank Dr. Shadley Schifrin and also Dr. Natty Hamid.
Both are from Ortho Carolina. We hope that this medical broadcast has helped you become more health wise. Now, keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, we have many topics coming up in the next several weeks, and we thank you so much for being with us week after week. If you did not have a chance to tweet your question or email me your question during the hour, or better yet, call us, you can do so. You can call the station during the week. You can also email jpop at wtvi.org, and I will get those questions to our doctors. We thank you so much for being here. Promise to come back. Ortho Carolina has always been a big instrumental player with this mission. We thank you once again. Have a good week, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next time. If you would like support group information about tonight's topic or any HealthWise topic, call SupportWorks at 704-331-9500. If you have a comment or question about HealthWise, call 704-371-8836 or email us at healthwise at wtvi.org or go to the website wtvi.org. If you are interested in being a guest on HealthWise or like to sponsor a HealthWise program, please call Suzanne Milkey at 704-372-2442. Learn more about HealthWise and other local productions at WTVI.org. Go to our website and you will see current and upcoming events on air and in the community. That and much more at WTVI.org.